Hi, everybody. Welcome to the weekend and welcome to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntris here. Maria Cabardo, documentarian from the East Coast, joins us for uh, a conversation about a groundbreaking artist who uh, made an impact uh, both uh, in the Bronze Age and I think is an inspiration for a lot of comic creators today. The name of the documentary that Maria made was Better Things, uh, The Life and Times of Jeffrey Catherine Jones. Jeffrey Catherine Jones transgendered uh, midway through their life and uh, ended uh, their life uh, as a woman and um, is a very interesting individual case and history about uh, the person because the person did feel that referring to their life prior to the transgender change uh, those memories are those of a male and then of course uh, she transitioned into and referred to herself as she so uh, it's a very individual story it's a fascinating story about the Bronze Age it features a lot of great interviews from uh, people that were inspired uh, by Jones like Mike Mignola and Morbi Mobius, I was going to say Morbius, not the living vampire, no, Jean Giraud, uh, Mike Kaluta and Barry Windsor Smith, uh, who were uh, artist mates at uh, Jones's groundbreaking The Studio, uh, where uh, they worked with uh, Barry Wrightson and also uh, Kaluta and Barry Windsor Smith. It's an amazing documentary. The photographs are incredible. Think of all your favorite Bronze Age creators uh, in their uh, 20s having a ball, having after hours and stuff. I mean, I've certainly experienced those kind of fun times here in Chicago with uh, Chica the Chicago comics community. Great pictures of Neil Adams, Jim Steranko, um, Jeffrey's former wife, uh, Louise Jones, who of course became Louise Simonson. Uh, unbelievable observations from all of them and how Jones's life touched them all and certainly their art as well. So without further ado, I want to present this great conversation with Maria Cabardo. Better Things, The Life of Jeffrey Catherine Jones is a documentary that Kino Lorber distributed, and uh, you can find it at the Kino Lorber uh, website. You can find it at Amazon or Maria's website as well. But here's that amazing conversation about an incredible creator on Word Balloon. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. We're going to look at uh, the way people make things, uh, both from an introspective standpoint and also a practical business standpoint. Uh, we start off with Maria Cabardo. Maria is a documentarian and the uh, filmmaker behind Better Things, The Life and Choices of Jeffrey Catherine Jones. Now, if you don't know about uh, Jeffrey Jones, uh, let me uh, refer to his Wikipedia page and give you a little bit of a, a primer. Uh, he was an American artist. He passed away. Actually, it's going to be the fifth anniversary of uh, Catherine's death, uh, May 19th, 2011. Uh, Jeffrey Jones was an American artist whose work is best known from the late 60s through the 2000s. Uh, Jones provided over 150 covers for many different types of books through 1976, as well as venturing into fine art during and after this time. Uh, Frank Frazetta, while both were alive, called Jeffrey Jones the greatest living painter. Um, Jeffrey was married to Louise Alexander, who became Louise Jones, later married Walter Simonson, and you might know her best as Louise Simonson, the co-creator of X Factor and, uh, you know, a wonderful writer and editor. Uh, she and Jeff met in college, and uh, when Jeffrey started his career uh, drawing professionally, uh, Louise Wheezy was uh, one of the editors at Warren Publishing and got Jeff a lot of his uh, early gigs. His first comic book work was in Blazing Combat, uh, 1965, in October from Warren. He later did things for Creepy and Eerie. He did uh, a great series that's very well known called Idol for National Lampoon. Uh, he also, again, was part of the studio with Bernie Wrightson, Barry Windsor Smith, and Michael Kaluta. Uh, Dragon's Dream produced a volume of their work in 1979. And really, when you think of like the image creators and, and you know starting image comics, a precursor to that was the studio. And it was very infamous in a great way of these excellent art illustrators getting together and really starting to do their own work for their own reasons. And, uh, you know, really a lot of uh, publishers would take their finished work and build stories around the covers. Pretty amazing stuff. So uh, also later in his life, uh, Jeffrey has a very interesting personal story, um, ultimately decided he really was a woman inside, 
and transgendered late in his life and became Jeffrey Catherine Jones. Um, I hope it doesn't offend anyone because there are times in the conversation between Maria Cabardo and myself, we refer to Jeff as he in the past tense, and sometimes we correct ourselves. It's not that we're trying to offend anyone and we hope that no one takes offense. Jeffrey Catherine Jones referred to herself as Jeff uh, when talking to Maria, and Maria sometimes does refer to him mostly as, or herself, mostly as Jeff. Just wanted to get that out there because I know that, uh, you know, it's... It's a learning time for all of us, and I and I really think this film illustrates that, and and really does explain Jones's own personal difficulties in accepting the person that he is or was and became, uh, and uh, also how uh, Jones expressed uh, herself through her art. It's it's a really amazing story. There are great interviews with Mike Kaluta and Bernie Wrightson. Louis Simonson is in the film. Mike Mignola is in the film. Mobius is in the film. Kent Williams. Uh, wow. Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, so many great artists. Paul Pope. Uh, all talking about the influence that uh, the work of Jeffrey Jones had on their own careers and their own art choices. It's really great. And I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, you can get the film through Maria's site, macabfilms.com. You can also order it through Amazon. Again, it's called Better Things, The Life and Choices of Jeffrey Catherine Jones. We'll mention that probably a lot during the uh, the interview. But I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Maria Cabardo about her excellent film. I present it to you now on Word Balloon. I am very pleased to have documentarian Maria Paz Cabardo on the phone. Uh, Maria, it's it's great to talk to you. We met two years ago, and I and you uh, Gary Gianni introduced us. And I could not believe the subject of your film. And I just got to tell you how much I enjoyed it. And finally, it took us two years, but finally we're talking about this excellent documentary about Jeffrey Catherine Jones. And it's a pleasure to have you on Word Balloon. Thank you for coming on. Well, thanks, John, for inviting me into your show. And even though it's two years after we've met, better late than never, right, I would say. And a lot of things have happened for you and the film since. We're going to talk about that. But um, you're in a unique position. I I, uh, I want to let the people know that beyond being a documentarian and uh, that you you know you're you're definitely of the geek culture. You were telling me that you used to work for role playing game uh, companies, right? Yes, I I I work for role playing game companies, and that's actually where I started. Um, I started at Mayfair Games in Chicago, Illinois, by Niles, um, mm-hmm. and I was working on like um, D&D games, that that type of stuff, like uh, the DC Comics role-playing games. I, I worked on that. We also did board what, games and all that other what stuff. What did you do for them? I was an art director for them, so I was in charge of wow. the art department, yeah. Okay, and were you, I mean, I, I know some comic uh, and fantasy, obviously artists will not only do comic books, but obviously they do do role-playing games. So, uh, like I said, Gary Gianni introduced us. Who were some of the artists that uh, you, you directed back then? Um, I've worked with um, Simon Bisley, um, Ian Miller. Um, I've worked with um, let's see, a lot, a lot of the guys who are now um, are pretty much almost legends in their own right. Like uh, Dave McKean, I've worked with Dave McKean. Sure. Um, yes, I've also I work with the comic book guys, and I also worked with illustrators like uh, Dave Dorman. Uh, I worked hmm. with Brom. Uh, yes, Phil Dave. Hill. Uh, Phil Hale, Rick Barry. Um, I worked with Frank Rosetta when I was at Wizards of the Coast. Wow! Yeah, he was a great guy. He was he was really nice. He did everything I asked I him to do. So I was very that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> wow! No, I'm really impressed. And the great thing is, uh, for this documentary, you you reached out to so many comic book legends uh, to speak about it, contemporaries of of Jeffrey's. Uh, but also a lot of people inspired by him. But let's let's get back to the very beginning. What led you to want to tell this story about Jeffrey Catherine Jones? Um, well, it started with me trying to do other things, you know, besides design and publishing, because I've always done that. And I went to uh, the New York Film Academy and started taking a filmmaking class. And um, after that, I, you know, film is such a, big uh, project to, to undertake, you know, because it requires a lot of people, it takes a lot of time, a lot of money. Yeah. 
so after I finished my course, I wanted to make a film, and I figured a documentary might have been an easier uh, thing to start with, which I was point to. I was told by my crew uh, when we started was like not the right. You know, he, they were teasing me, saying, "You thought it was easy. It's actually very hard." <laughs> they said. So yeah. So and, and as a documentarian, I think it's easier if you work on something that you're very familiar with or that, that you already have a passion for or sure. some background. And I, I thought imme- immediately that I would do something about artists or art uh, in my field, which it could be anything. It could be in the role-playing field or the comic book field or the computer gaming field. So um, I have worked with pretty much most of the um, popular artists back then, um, and I, I've always wanted to work with Jeff Jones. Um, and also, I just want to make it clear to people that I am calling Jeff, Jeffrey Catherine Jones, Jeff, because he asked me to call him Jeff, and I'm used to calling him Jeff. I mean, and this was after his transition, you know. So I, I know some people would probably be wondering why I call him Jeff, and with no other reason than that that's what he asked me to call him. So, um, so, so Yeah, so Jeff was the um, only painter that I've seen, uh, artist that I, I wanted to work with that I didn't know, or I don't, you know, I don't see him in conventions. I don't see him right. anywhere. So I decided to sort of like do research on him. And I decided after hearing all these stories from people about him, that he was a very interesting person. So I asked a friend, Robert Wiener, to introduce me to him, um, because I wanted to, you know, use him as the subject for my film. But prior to that, before we met, I asked his good friend, uh, Michael Kaluta, if he didn't mind me shooting a segment of an interview, like a short interview, and I would edit it and present it to Jeff when I meet him so that he has an idea of what I want us to do, you know, so he would have an, an idea of what my vision for the film would be. And so Michael was very nice and said yes. And without Michael, I probably wouldn't have made the film, too. So, uh, yeah, and Jeff saw it and he liked it, you know, and that was how it happened. Wow. Yeah, you know, people will watch this film and see, certainly they might be aware of where his life took him and the fact that he did... Uh, transgender later in life. And, you, you know, I think through your narrative and his words, his own words, uh, I will also call him Jeff for the purposes of the conversation, um, that, you know, really, he's a very conflicted man, and I think uh, also very shy. And yet you got him to be incredibly candid about his art choices, and certainly his life choices as well. And um, was that hard to kind of uh, get him. I mean, because really, there you know there are relationships that start and finish that he talks about, and and certainly talks about the beginnings and the ends of those. Uh, was it was it difficult for Jeff to to talk about this? Um, no, uh, actually, it was it wasn't very difficult for him. He actually was very candid and um, very chatty, and he it almost sounded like he wanted to talk to someone, you know, about his. That's bus. great. And uh, I was very lucky that he chose me as because I heard from a lot of people that he was he wasn't very talkative or he wasn't very um um you know expressive because he is sure. very very shy I mean that I I think I I agree with but once he gets to know you and he lets you in his his life then he's actually a very funny very very smart guy um definitely and he I know people would think he was conflicted and maybe he was but I did not get that impression at all. I, oh. I mean, I did not know him for a long time because I know there are other people who's know, who, who who've known him for, uh, you know, for a, you know, a lifetime, and I'm sure they have their um, own opinions based on their own experiences with him. But for the three, two years that I've known him, um, I did not at all find him conflicted. Um, I don't know okay. if it was me or maybe that was the point in his life where he was more, you know, resolved and and yes. accepting about your life. Because we do go through our our doubts when we were younger, you know, and our struggles. And But after a while, as you get older, um, I think you become more 
um, you learn to accept yourself, I think, after a while. And I, I don't know if that's the case with him, but I, I think he, I mean, and I hope I showed it in the movie that he, this was someone who knew exactly what he was doing right from the beginning. And it seemed like he was aware of all the choices that he made, whether it was good or bad. I mean, I thought that was like, I was, when we were interviewing him, I was like, I kept saying, you did that? I was like, you were fine with that? <laughs> and and, I, and I, sometimes I'd be like, how could you do that? He's your friend. <laughs> and he just smiled. Wow. Yeah, I never thought he was, um, he, he wasn't regretful. He wasn't like, oh, Understood. he never would blame anyone. I never heard him say, oh, I'm here because of this or I'm here because of that. I remember one time I asked him, um, one of his biggest issues, I think, that I, I, I don't know if people knew was um, he was um, depressive. He was, he, 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 was uh, he had issues with depression. And he would have moments when we would shoot that he would be in a bad state. And, and, and we would not do anything when he, would, when he had his bad days. Okay. So one time I remember him, I asked him because he said he wasn't feeling good and things were not, um, uh, he wasn't in a healthy state at that time during that day I, I called him. And so I mentioned something like maybe you're in the wrong place, you know, maybe you needed to be somewhere else to be, you know, so that you would take your mind off things and maybe you would be in a more positive environment. And he just laughed and he said, he said, believe me, Maria, I'm, I'm in the right place. And, you know, I was like, I, I, you know, so he always had a choice, and I think he, he first for for my, I don't know if it's for my benefit or whatever, but every time I talked to him, he seemed to always know what he wanted. So, okay, well, and certainly um, by the time we get to where he was as you were filming it, yeah, he had made his choices and and seemed to had created a life that he could handle, manage, and was content. And also, the, I mean, the amazing thing, this is one of the guys from the studio, which, you know, is, is famous to a generation of, of comic book fans. Uh, some of my listeners are younger and they may not know, but you mentioned Mike Kaluta, Bernie Wrightson, Barry Windsor Smith, and Jeff. And the three others have certainly, um, you know, generated work since the time of the studio and, and had, you know, significant runs at some of the major comic publishers like DC and Marvel um, and continue to make great work today in some cases like Bernie and, and Mike Kaluta. Um, but Jeff really left comics, went into the fantasy art world more, you know, and, and really more painting and then certainly just kind of stopped and and like you said, wasn't going to conventions, so he didn't keep up his persona. So there really was this mystery, and a right. lot of it was also the fact that he finally just even stopped painting, which uh, you know might shock some creative people. And you right. know that. So yeah, please speak of, speak about you know that journey of his. Well, first of all, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the younger artists or the younger crowd because I would I would like to let them know that they really should look into all these four guys' work. And even artists yes. from the past, because um, especially if you want to do comic book work, because not that that's really how comics were done back then. You know, people actually drew on paper and you <laughs> and pencil and studied and worked on stuff that they couldn't do all the time. I remember when I was at Michael Kaluta's house and he showed me. I, I looked. I was looking because he had tons and tons of books, um, and he on top of the shelves. Uh, there were a bunch of like um, sketchbooks, and I said, "What are those?" And he said, "Oh, um, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I it, I remember that he it was more to the effect like him saying, these, these are the books that, that that I that shows the stuff that I need to work on, or like I guess it's his practice, <laughs> book, you know, and and sure, yeah, and these guys didn't get to be very good at what they did just by, you know, uh, depending on their talent. I mean." They drew all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they worked at it. Absolutely. This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex has a brand new graphic novel coming out from Marvel and Abrams Books, Fantastic Four, Full Circle. It comes out September 6th. It's a rainy night in Manhattan, and not a creature is stirring except 
for The Thing, Ben Grimm. When an intruder suddenly appears inside the Baxter building, the Fantastic Four find themselves surrounded by a swarm of invading parasites. These carrion creatures, composed of negative energy, come to Earth using a human host as a delivery system. But for what purpose? And who is behind this untimely invasion? The Fantastic Four have no choice but to journey to the Negative Zone, an alien universe comprised entirely of antimatter, risking not just their own lives, but the fate of the cosmos. Fantastic Four Full Circle is the first long-form work written and illustrated by acclaimed artist Alex Ross, who revisits a classic Lee Kirby story from the 60s and introduces the storyline for a new generation of readers. Bold, vivid colors, his trademark visual storytelling, Ross takes Marvel's first team of superheroes to places only he can illustrate. The book also features a special poster jacket with the front flap unfolding to reveal an all-new fully painted origin story of the Fantastic Four. Again, Fantastic Four, full circle, out September 6th. For more details, go to alexrossart.com. Right. Yeah, and you, you get, I think you get that certainly when you show a lot of, of Jeff's work as well. Um, you know, that, and, and really they talk about this as well. They talk about their time together when they, they formed the studio. And it's funny, uh, you know, a lot of younger people know about the image creators breaking away from the publishers and starting uh, image comics, doing their own thing. Uh, back in 76, these four artists, uh, Kaluta, Jones, Wrightson, and Smith, all decided to, to form this, this space and, and create the studio and then also make that amazing book from 1976 that featured their art. And, you know, it really was a statement and it made them a lot of money, I'm assuming, too, back then. I mean, well, it was really this kind of unheard of, or, or maybe not, but it was this unheard of project that right. outside of, like, working for Marvel or DC or a paperback company that's doing a fantasy book, you know, they, they really created this, this book of, of, of ideas and, and, their, and their paintings and drawings and stuff. And it's amazing. Well, there, they had a couple of things going for them. I mean, first of all, they were very driven. Um, then they were very talented. And they're also very popular. So, so, mm -hmm. and and given that that they all had that, they even decided to like, okay, let's get really better at what we do by just doing what we want to do. So I think that's yeah, you know, not a lot of people would do that. And uh, yeah. you're from Chicago, you know Michael yes. Jordan. You know how yes. many, he won a lot of Leo championships. He he, re he retired, came back, retired. But by the time he retired, he had like what four rings or five rings. Six but rings. Jeff Jones retired or or stopped doing what he, you know, stopped doing a lot of you know full time commercial work when he was just getting towards the peak of his career. He was like, oh, I'm getting famous. You know what? I'm just gonna stop and do my thing. So you know, he did a lot of stuff that we I would never do, especially if you want to go. You know, if you have a, you have all these goals to become successful in life, because he was just like, he did a lot of things that that we even up to now I would think would have been ahead of his time. I mean, these four guys did, um, you know, like like uh, with his transgender, um, with the um, with all the, you know, with his freelance, with his doing fine arts. I mean, he did that way back then when. I mean, even even Frank Frazetta, I think, or the other guys, they kept doing their commercial work because they needed, you know, they needed the work. And right. even though, you know, I'm saying they didn't stop working for other people. Uh, but Jeff actually, right by the time he was became, becoming famous, was like, eh, I'm just going to stop this and I'll just improve on my craft and just do the stuff that I want to do. So it, Jeff, if he wanted to, even to the very last day, he was not lacking of publishers and clients who wanted his work. So money was not the issue. Because I know people who would have bought, you know, a sketch on a table napkin from him. Certainly. Uh, but, yeah. And he knew that. I, I kept telling him that. I said, Jeff, you know, if you do something for the film, I won't have to do Kickstarter. <laughs> <I> <laughs> <laughs> right? But sure. sure. No, you're but right. He just smiled at me and said, "No." Nah. I'm like, "Fine." So I had to go find, you know, the money somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you did. And the the great thing is, people are going to be blown away by his art when they see it because he is 
equal to these peers that we're talking about of his, the Kalutas, the Wrightsons, the Barry Windsor Smiths, the Frazettas, because his fantasy art is of that Frazetta quality that it's just mind-bogglingly good. And just, you, you know, his ideas. Um, and also, they came at a time when they were still, when, when Jeff was still doing comics and the rest of them, when, they, when Warren Publications was really expanding uh, the ideas of comic book art beyond the clean lines of the, you know, people like um, Kurt Swan doing Superman. And I love Kurt, Kurt Swan. But, you know, those kind of, cla- or even the Milton Kniffs and uh, the adventure artist style and stuff. I mean, these guys really came with a more, uh, c- um, I guess, fine art uh, background and, and inspiration to tell these science fiction and fantasy stories. Right. I would I would say that they started all these painted graphic novel type, painterly type yes. of comics. And I could, I, I don't know, I could be wrong if I am, please let me know. But I think they were the first one, they were the, they were the ones who started it uh, I think back you're right. then. Uh, now we have all these other painters. You know, now we have Bill Sienkiewicz, Kent William, uh, George Pratt, who actually, George Pratt and Kent and John J. Muse were actually sort of like uh, big fans of Jeff as well. So, sure, sure. Uh, so I think they led the way towards that because I think when these artists were much younger and they saw what could be done, you know, instead of like a typical Jack Kirby-ish cover, which is still great, I'm, I'm not discounting. Absolutely. Or, but but then somebody goes in and does something, you know, same subject matter, but all of a sudden it's in the um, John Singer Sargent style. Then you're kind of like, these kids are like, oh, my God, we can do that. So a Certainly. lot of the artists, I think, who were in the movie uh, felt that when they first saw Jeff, Jeff and the studio guys work. So um, and I think that was their, their, their biggest contribution, you know, to inspire other artists. I think for me that's a wonderful thing because you you've reached and communicated through your artwork and have touched other people's lives. Another thing that I love too is you're covering this period and um the way you present it in the documentary is terrific because it really shows that the comic book artists and writers of that time were uh living that rock and roll lifestyle that we see so much in music documentaries. But I think it was great to see because these are artistic people, obviously. And it, it's just, I mean, New York in the early seventies, you know, there's even the HBO show right now, vinyl uh, happening, but uh, you'd hear about their, their uh, Friday night parties, uh, you know, Louis Simonson and the others talk about these parties and we're seeing Starenko and Neil Adams and Len Wein and Marv Wolfman and certainly uh, Louise Simonson as kids. Yes, yes. I mean, and it's he, so he, great to see them, you know, really being young people. And I think young people who go to conventions and know these names, I think it will be great for them to see this as well and see them really living the same kind of life that any 20 year old is living when they're just getting started and their creative juices are at their peak, but they're just having fun. Right. And Weezy, Louise uh, is, you know, she's another. She's another trailblazer. She was probably one of the few women in comic books during that time who worked with all the good artists. I mean, it takes a lot to be in that position at that time because you you have to be very good at what you do and you have to be able to communicate with all these crazy talented artists, you know, for them to get the work done in, in on time, to get the best job. Um, um, you know, in uh, as possible for the project, and she was, from what I heard, an amazing editor. And during that time, there was very few women uh, involved in the comic book Definitely. industry. So no, all, you're these, right. all these people that were in the film, I, I just thought I'd like to bring these people to everyone's attention now because you know. It's history, as far as I'm concerned, and it will be history um, at some point. And we forget. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring all these, I, I mentioned a lot of the older guys. People forget about them, you know? And yes. And somebody asked me about one of these guys, like uh, the guy who did the first Conan. Oh, my God. Um, I oh, uh, I forgot their names. You, and you're not talking about Barry. But, Al Williamson, uh, I mean. Oh, Al Williamson, certainly. It wasn't Al Williamson, but Al Williamson, uh, all Roy those Crank- guys. 
And I didn't know who they were. And I was like, who are these guys? I don't know who they are. And so, and somebody, one of the, my artist friends said, here, they showed me the work. And I was like, oh my God, how can we forget these types of people? I don't understand. So I brought them in and I showed their work as well because I wanted people to know this guy did this. Um, and they might not be part of the bigger picture, uh, the story of the film, but they were a big part of Jeff's life way back then because they mentored him. And, Understood. And I think I think I, I wanted to mention them because I figured if it triggered something with the viewers, they will then hopefully Google them and learn more about these guys, you know, and before it's too late and then they become obscure. So, right. Uh, well, and that's and and to talk to these people before they they leave. I mean, my God, you've got Mobius talking about you know Jeff's impact on his work and. It's, uh, what a what a wonderful thing that you were able to get this before before he passed away, and and you know so that's great. But no, I agree with you, and truly one of the reasons why I do my podcast and speak to some of the older creators is for that reason as well. No, their work is significant; it shouldn't be forgotten. And also, I want them to tell their story while they can, because yeah. sometimes people who look back put their own um, feelings on onto the, what they're reporting. And sometimes they get it wrong, frankly, and they, or they misinterpret what, um, you know, an intent of an artist or a, a significant person, what, regardless of what the history is that you're trying to do. Let the person tell their own story and answer those questions rather than sometimes what I see online is speculative. Oh, well, they were doing that because of uh, this reason. And, you know, some, it, sometimes it just isn't true. No, no. I mean, we can never really tell about how a person feels. Until, you know, I guess until we ask them, and sometimes they don't right. even know, you know. I mean, we don't. True. Sometimes. sometimes we do things just because we want to do it, and that's about it. I mean, one of the things that I remember that Jeff and I got along very well with was when things were not happening the way we want it to be, we kind of just like, okay, we just let it be, you know. We were like, or if we don't know something, because Jeff didn't, he's a very, very smart guy. But there are things that he'd be like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, if you don't know, then I won't ask anymore, <laughs> you know? Yeah, maybe there isn't an answer, sure. Right. Sometimes things don't have an answer, and that's the answer. You know, I for I'm me, sure. I'm, I'm not looking for why is the chair a chair, you know? I, it's the chair. <laughs> Sit on it. I understand. <laughs> now, we talk about Louise Simonson, and she's a very important part of yeah. the story as well. I had no idea. I knew that Louise, before she married Walter, was Louise Jones and Wheezy Jones, but I didn't realize that she was married to Jeff. I mean, Stan Lee and Jim Lee aren't related, so you don't you don't necessarily realize <laughs> that these contemporaries were you know together. But you know, yeah, they were married, and uh, you know, Jeff kind of always had this feeling that you know he liked he liked to dress in women's clothing. It was yeah. certainly in the fifties and sixties. I can't imagine the guilt and and uh, concern that someone an individual might feel about that in that environment and in that very repressed uh, time period in America and then I, you, I think really the film really does just kind of explain uh their relation their initial relationship and as you say Louise is incredibly smart and I have a feeling probably helped and and you, you might be able to answer this did she because of their once they got together as a couple um she kind of helped Jeff get some of those initial jobs at Warren. I mean, she was an editor at Warren, and yes. Jeff's an artist. So I imagine that it was easier just in terms of, hey, you know, by the way, my boyfriend and then husband is this amazing artist. Let's use him for, you know, some of the stories. And yeah, certainly his work was worthy. I think she did. I mean, I, I, I didn't really ask him, her or him about that, but I was under the impression that she was in charge of sort of like, um, clearing the path for him. Yeah, the business you know, side, Jeff sure. wanted to paint and work. I don't think, but he's very right. shy. So I don't think he would be going around. Um, maybe even with, I, I would think she was the cheerleader for him. Certainly. Did you could do this and do that? Because, you know, a lot of women, uh, wives do that, especially with artists. <laughs> they sure, to absolutely. Together. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right about that. No, my father used to, you know, refer to my um, mom as the brains of the outfit. Yeah, I understand I what you're think, talking about. Yeah, and I, you know, like I said, she's also a very, very smart lady. Um, yes. Very, very wonderful lady. Talented as well. Funny, you know, and um, very compassionate. And um, I was really, really glad that she was able to honestly 
talked to me as well. I mean, she was very candid and honest, I yes. think, with, with how she felt. And and granted, given the situation, I think I she had, you know, she perfectly was, you know, her reactions were perfectly valid. And sure. I, was, I was very lucky that she was open enough to let us film that. And um, it showed, you know. And also the funny thing about Jeff, and this is why I was saying that he was very shy, a lot of the women, even his daughter, didn't know a lot of the stuff that he was talking about or were not aware. And I remember Juliana saying, oh, I didn't know that about my dad. Or some of the ex-girlfriends would say, you know more than we do. <laughs> so that's wow. How, you know, that's how um, how hard to break into his shell it was for them, I, I think. You know, if I could, if I could speak for them. I, uh, that's that's because I would I would get after the film they all told me they didn't know that or a lot of them even even Weezy was like oh I didn't know that or I wasn't aware of that. Interesting. So, and yeah, she, and and that's how that's how uh, private Jeff was. Um, and, and and was she was she willing uh, like was it hard to get her to cooperate and and be on film I, and and talk no. about this. No, she 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 wasn't. She um, I think I think maybe the funny thing is, a lot of these people at first I thought were like not talking to each other, you know, given the the history and all the sure. pain and hurt. But like I said again, maybe as you get older, you know, people are a lot more forgiving. And also, Weezy has Juliana, so if you have a child with someone, you you can't just you know cross them out of your life, you know, especially if they're you know, if they're trying to work on on things, you know, between yes. themselves and everybody else. So um, it's funny because Jeff wasn't really helping me with all these people. I had to find all these people um, to interview, and Gret and knowing that I didn't know much about Jeff, it was it was a lot of work and it was so uh, very challenging, but. Uh, back then, it was my first first film, and sometimes I do believe in when about that saying that what you don't know won't won't hurt you or something like that, or what makes you uh, things that make you um, that you struggle with make you stronger. Sure. <laughs> just, if, well, you don't know. You, yeah, if if it's your first film, you don't know what not to ask as a prof- you know as a seasoned filmmaker might. So luckily, that worked to your advantage, and you were able to. I would just say, yeah, obviously persevere and, and do things that, again, maybe with more experience, you'd be like, well, that's not done. I shouldn't do that. So it's that kind of like, <laughs> Which this, is, I'm right? Is it that kind I'm of. I'm going to be doing for my second film. <laughs> well, there now you go. I'm, well, in fact, now I'm a yeah, little you, more careful. <laughs> <laughs> and another relationship, and, and again, amazing story, but Von Bodie and, and Jeff's relationship. And that's really amazing. And. You know, and and hearing his son talk about Bodhi's son, uh, talk about Vaughn and Jeff. Um, and that's what I'm saying. This is really just an amazing uh, story about about Jones and the, this incredible talent who had all these all these uh, personal challenges in his life, um, and 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 you know still managed. You know, was producing amazing art. I mean, did did you get the sense that uh, maybe he really was just at probably most at peace when he was drawing again. Now at the end of the story, he's not drawing anymore and seems very content, but did, you know, did any sort of solace in, in, in the work and that that's really kind of where he could really express himself uninhibited by what others might think. Yes. Well, he did mention that his life was crazy back then. Not, not crazy in a, like, like, like a bad way. Maybe it is for some for some of his friends, but but there was a lot of things going on. I mean, he had he had all these issues. He was younger, so he did say. I guess I did ask him. I remember asking him, "How is it that your life is so crazy, but your artwork seems to be very calm and yes. and, and because that's the feeling you get, you know? I mean, yes. when I do art direction, being a nun, I'm not a good painter. I'm not a good drawer, but I the way I would art direct these great artists would be, I can't tell them how to paint. You know, I can't tell them how to do, I can't tell them what color to use. I can't tell them this is how I want it to be, but I give them impressions of what I think I like. And when their work comes in, 
you, I, I give them my reaction. I don't go, you know, oh, you should be, I, I go, well, something. I just go, oh, this makes me feel like this or this makes me feel like that. So with Jeff, all his pieces, no matter what it is, they all have the same feeling of calmness, of, of just, you look at it and you get this sense of, of, of like peacefulness, which is weird because the artist, life is not that way and he said well that's why i paint that way he said that's probably you know he said that's why i paint it's to find you know it's an escape for him and i wow. think he said that yeah and, wow. and that's why it shows i guess you know i i don't know if if i just think that's the way he thinks you know an artist an artist is unique because of how he thinks you can never have two of the same guy because there's only one vision so, and it comes from somebody's way of thinking. So, sure, you know, like everybody can, can, can do, can copy Frazetta, but the feeling of the real Frazetta is not going to be there. Understood. If, yes. if you look, you know, the things that you don't see are actually what matters the most. So, when you see a painting, I remember seeing a Phil Hale one time on, on one of, I think it was Playboy, and a husband who loves. Phil Hale's work showed it to me and he said, mm-hmm. oh, here's a new Phil Hale painting. And I was like looking at it and I was like, that looks like Phil Hale, but it, does some, it doesn't feel like his work, you know? And sure enough, it was done by somebody else. I didn't even realize. Wow. That. Okay. Crazy. Man, yeah. No, and I, don't, I know what you mean in terms of, yeah, there's the serenity. And also, am I, I mean, it seemed like in some of the uh, uh, paintings that you, that you chose for the film, um, in some of the female faces, you see Jeff, and it, it seems like Jeff, and I, maybe that's just my own reaction to the art, but I kind of see Jeff in, in some of the women's faces. Well, Jeff's work was an extension of himself, so I think that's unavoidable. You know, I mean, there you go. When he was trying to find whatever it was he was trying to find when he wanted to be good at it, you know, when he was, when he was painting it. So you can't take away the artist's mind and persona from the work because it is him. So I, I'm not surprised that a lot of his paintings have semblances to, to, to him physically or, you know, there are some messages coming up probably, but it all depends on what you get because Jeff won't tell you. He likes, he, he, for a smart person, I think that's one of the reasons why he was also lonely. It's very hard for him to find people who can can understand him. I mean, if you're uh, at a different level where you do things so differently, you know, you'd have to go and hang out with the Von Bodies, you know, who also does things differently because those are right. probably the people who you could connect most. And they did um, in their own way. Yes. But it's very hard, you know, so so he, Jeff wanted, like to see the people's reactions. He, I think he liked that. He, he, he was, he, he would rather have you explain because for him, he learns, oh, I didn't even see that from what I was doing. So I think that that sort of like gets him uh, going, knowing how how um, his work affected people in different ways. I understand what you're saying. And also, it was great to hear Kaluta even talk about how uh, they, the three of them would struggle, Windsor Smith and him and, uh, and Wrightson, in terms of what they were trying to draw and their feeling was that Jeff was doing it so effortlessly. And in, in, in the meantime, Jeff felt like maybe I wasn't working hard enough watching the other three work and, and that, you know, Jones felt that, you know, he had to, you know, work harder. And they're like, no, you, and you know, Kalu's like, no, you don't understand. We wish it was as effortless as you seem to be. And that's well, great. Yeah. And it, it, it just, yeah, just the, 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 you know, again, appreciating the genius of, of Jones's work and, and the way that he approached it. Well, it, they were all crazy good. That's all I can say. All of them were crazy good. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I've, had the, I've, I've met Bernie and I've met uh, Michael. Uh, I never met Barry. And, uh, and also I, people, uh, people shouldn't forget, they really worked very hard to learn to become very good at what they did. Nobody, they're just not drawing, you know, they really studied, they researched, they traveled, um, you know, they spoke to people, they, they, they read a lot. So these guys are not, they're very serious about becoming good at what they do. So they're not just talented, they're also very skilled. And you, you don't get that just by 
you know, doing your, your own thing. You know, you, you you have to have the uh, the um, the, um, the 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 willingness to learn from others. Mm-hmm. So, well, you mentioned Michael. You mentioned Michael Jordan earlier. It's like what Malcolm Gladwell always says: you have to put your ten thousand hours of work in to become great. And they had the work ethic to to really, you know, to 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 get better. And they wanted to get better, and were willing to put the time in to get better. Right, right. And it's just unfortunate that in the comic book industry, um, a lot of artists are not. A lot of people don't know how to tap into their their abilities. You know, there people think that okay, I'm giving you everything you need, just do it. Um, I used to tell um, my art directors who used to work for me when I was at Wizards of the Coast, uh, you don't hire the artist hand, you hire his mind as well, mm-hmm. because if he just did what you told him to do, you you should have just done it yourself. You know, if you're an illustrator, if you're an art director who can paint and draw. What, what's the point of going to someone who's, who's got this magnificent mind as well if you're just going to tell him how to do it, to do his job? So, so, and I, and coming from the other side, being an art director too, all of these artists are crazy. They're also very hard to work with because they want to do things a certain way, and sometimes they forget that this is a job. You know, as an art director, you have a responsibility to your marketing department. Yeah. So, so a lot of them sometimes feel entitled because there's this and that. And so it's, it's, you know, being an art director is a very hard job. <laughs> Understood. Sure. No, you've got to, you got to wrangle people that aren't used to work, uh, you know, requirements and getting your, you know, deadlines and, you know, things like that. No, I, I understand. I've, I've spoken to many an art director and I can appreciate the frustration. Yeah. Of and, and you got, you have to do a lot of research so you find the right, if you find the right artist who loves the subject matter that you're working on, that's the person you should go to because you'll get more than what you pay for. You know, that's, Understood. Then you, get, you get their heart, you get their mind, you get their time. But if you go, you know, if you go to Dave McKean and say, and, and ask Dave McKean to like, Hey Dave, can you do a Spider-Man for me? a la Jack Kirby. I mean, I'm sure he can do it. <laughs> you know? I'm sure he can do it, but would he want to do it? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. You've got, you've got amazing artists too. Like I said, talking about, uh, uh, Jones and, and really the studio and all. And we mentioned Bill Sienkiewicz uh, and uh, George, George Pratt and uh, Dave McKean and um, certainly Paul Pope. And Paul Pope, it's great to see him, you know, speak as much as he does. Uh, I know that's someone that a lot of younger younger readers know and, and, and love his work. Um, yeah, it, I, I really think it's a great combination of, of Jones's peers, but also the, the people that he inspired. Uh, to right. to do the work that is being done now and everything. I mean, uh, God Sienkiewicz is very, I think, right. uh, candid, you know, about his love for the work and everything, right. and just I you think, know, astounded by it. Right. I think the best people to have talked to, to talk about Jones's work would be people who did what he did too. You know, I think they're the best people to. I'm not. Gonna, I I didn't want to interview like an art dealer or his ex girlfriend or a neighbor. You know, about what do you think of Jones's work. I think the, the the experts on 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 how to describe and assess Jones' work would be people who actually were doing what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a professional, it's 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 a it's a a professional and a personal assessment. I think of his work, even though some of them don't know him very well personally. But I think you know um, a lot of artists um, seem to. Um, especially the artists that they, they admire and respect seem to have a grasp of what, how that person thinks or how that person, or what that person is trying to do. You know, if you're a fan, I, I don't think those are things that you might catch as easily as all these guys can. And that's one of the reasons why I asked, you know, the Mobius, the, the, the Dave McKean, uh, Neil Gaiman of what they thought his work was, because then they would, were able to put, um, you know, um, sort of like a, a very educational uh, assessment of of how his work is done and and why his work feels that way. So. Agreed. Yeah. No, it comes. It absolutely comes through. That's why I, mean, I got to tell you, if you're this was your first documentary, it's 
I, I really think you did an amazing job. And also, I'm glad that in the two years since we met, my my pleasure. But also, uh, I'm congratulations on the success for the film. You were telling me uh, it won uh, won a couple awards at a, at a couple of festivals. Yes, I was I was very surprised um, when it did because you know it's it's a small indie film like self produced. Um, so marketing is not a very, you know, um, broad uh, opportunity. It didn't bring a lot of opportunities for me. But when it did, it was very, um, it was very fulfilling. And and the fact that you're appreciated is nice. I now actually understand. You know, when you get those those big award shows on TV, like the Oscars, and everybody's like, "Oh, I'm so happy!" I'm blah 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 blah. I'm like, "Thank you, God. Thank you, everybody." I, <laughs> You know, I, I always thought that, oh, my God, you guys are just saying that, you know. But you know what? They are very, they're from the heart. I'm telling you, the effort that anybody puts on any type of film, whether it's a crappy film or a good film, the effort is tremendous. And I, one thing I learned, I would never say a film is crappy anymore just out of respect for the people who actually got it done. <laughs> Understood, like yes, all the work that it's it takes to actually work. make one. Yes, yeah. understood. And a lot of money, like you said, and a lot of you, you told me when we were preparing to do this interview that you were very fortunate in terms of, uh, you know, your your friends that help you on your films, your your editor and your, you know, uh, your second director and, and, you know, things like that, your assistant director. Right. Because they they did this from they didn't do it because they liked me. They did it because they liked Jeff. <laughs> they they wow. are just work. And uh, without them, I, the film wouldn't have been done because there was a lot of challenges, you know, and, and any filmmaker would know that. So um, I I was just lucky, I guess, that I didn't know what I was doing and I just kept going. <laughs> that really helped me. Word Balloon is brought to you by my listeners. You are the sponsors of Word Balloon, the League of Word Balloon listeners, via subscriptions monthly to Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Hey. Couldn't do it without you, honestly, League. I, I truly appreciate your support. I appreciate your devotion, your listenership, and your patronage, honestly. Um, you know, if you can even spare a dollar a month, it's greatly appreciated. It helps me make these terrific shows, uh, go to conventions where I'm not sponsored, and, uh, you know, keep networking and, and uh, making interesting programming, hope, hopefully for you to enjoy every month here on Word Balloon. But I couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much. League of Word Balloon listeners. Again, if you want to subscribe to Word Balloon uh, for as little as a dollar a month, all you need to do is go to patreon.com slash word balloon, W-O-R-D-B-A-L-L-O-O-N. And again, I really appreciate your patronage, subscription, and attention, all of you, the League of Word Balloon listeners. The movie, I think, turned out great. It won Best Documentary at the Burbank Film Festival. Yes, it won Best Documentary um, at the Burbank Film Festival, I think it was a year ago. Um, wow. And it was a really nice surprise because it was just nice to be appreciated by people who are actually, you know, uh, real and expert and traditional filmmakers. Um, for me, that was a really, really nice surprise. And I felt humbled and I just was like very happy, you know. I was, it, was, it was amazing to be to be appreciated by people who actually knew what they were doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And and you told me that you, you got to show it at Disney. Tell me about that. Yeah. Did, did... Um, a lot of Disney uh, in Burbank actually invited me to show the film uh, in their private theater. Um, and it was one of their movies that were coming out. And so the artists were, most of them were very busy and a lot of them um, couldn't make it, but it was still a, a, a packed with with artists from Disney, they took a uh, a break from their work because we did it at lunchtime, and they provided pizza and everything else, and they showed the film, and everybody loved it. I had a um, Q and A afterwards, and everybody clapped at the end of it. And these are artists, animators at Disney, you know, top artists. And I met some of the guys in charge of different departments who were fans of the studio guys, um, not just Jeff, and they took their time out from from their film and. Um, they were planning to invite me again and show it at a bigger, at their bigger private theater. I'm like, how many theaters do they have in that? <laughs> I know, but 
da da. But um, that's still in the. I don't know if that that's going to happen. But it was nice of them to ask. But uh, yeah, I was. Artists are very very receptive to the film, and they seem to appreciate it a lot more than than most people. But I also get people who have nothing to do with comics who actually, uh, you know, different age range who were actually affected by the film as well. So, so that makes me very happy, you know. Um, I couldn't ask for anything more than that. You know, you do. You capture that era, really, uh, in terms of the interviews and the, uh, the photography that, that is used. Um, like I said, I mean, my God, seeing all these pictures of uh, these creative people that we know now as kind of the elder statesmen and women, of of the industry as as kids really just having fun and just being young in New York and and kind of experiencing life it's it's really exciting and I can understand the artists getting excited about the film as well because I do think that they will learn a lot uh, you know people who haven't seen it that are are you know artists and and writers will will find this I think really informative I can only imagine that you've got a lot of footage talking to Mobius and talking to Mike Mignola and, and Neil Gaiman and uh, Kaluta and, and, and Louise, uh, you know, so um, the, the, the DVD, well, first off, you know, like, do you, do you expect to do anything with that footage? Yes. Well, I'm, um, well, as you know, again, it's always going to be a question of funding and money because everything, sure. you know, everything you do with film is three times as much, you know, on any other project I've ever worked for. On. Um, so I'm hoping that when funding comes in, eventually, that I'd be able to do a, a uh, maybe a, a director's cut version or a some anniversary version with which would include a lot of the footages that were cut or were not included. Because I do have a lot of oh, the guys. Artists talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> So I do have a lot, a lot, so much of it. I couldn't even, sometimes I tell people stories and, and then I remember, oh my God, I, it's not on the film. So, but yes, I, I will be coming out hopefully once funding comes through. So if anybody's listening, if you're interested, you can help me with that. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I, I do. I am planning to come out with a, another version, hopefully sometime soon. Well, and in the meantime, um, I want people to know how they can see the film beyond, you know, the festivals that you've showed it at. You are selling the film. It is at Amazon at yes, Amazon.com. It's on, it's on Amazon.com. Uh, and it's also, uh, you can buy it through me as well, through my website, um, macabfilms.com, or you can contact me through the Facebook um, page of the film. Just put in better things, life and choices of Catherine Jeffrey Jones. You can message me there. And also Kino Lorber, who's my distributor, sells the downloadable version as well. So if you don't want to buy the DVD and you just want to watch it streaming, you can go to their website. I think it's AliveMind.com, which is their um, the, the, the branch that is handling my film. So okay. Oh, because I was wondering. Yeah, I was wondering if it was available at all via streaming or or whatever. So you can you can rent it online to watch it as well. I don't know if you can rent it, but I think you can buy it. Buy a download? the downloadable version. Yes, I'm not sure about the streaming. I know they're starting to do that, but I don't know if they've caught up on all the films. But I I, I do know they're they're looking into that. So okay, that's great. Well, and I'll and I'll give people at the end of the interview more ways to you know to to understand you know to figure out how to how to purchase it because it is it's an amazing movie um and absolutely worth worth people's time and i you know i i think you i think you did a hell of a job honestly i uh, i <laughs> Thank you. you know i are there other comic subjects or uh fantasy art uh subjects that you would like to do i mean i don't want to pigeonhole you and just do that what other films are you are thinking about thinking about making well, like I said, I, I do want to see if I can complete the studio, guys. I mean, I, it's it's a dream. You know, it's like, I might as well, right? And even for comic book fans or art lovers who just want to know how illustration and comics, like how 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 they get done. I mean, I don't know if people realize that, but making a comic book is one of the hardest art forms on the planet. You know, it's not, it, you're not just painting one one panel. You're You're doing a lot of things. Yeah, uh, in in a comic book that's that's so 
time consuming in a good way, you know, especially for the artist. But but uh, it it also takes a certain skill to be able to tell a story. It's not just drawing. You also have to, you know, you have to paste the pages. You have to um, make sure that all the words are where they should be. So there's a lot of stuff going. It's almost like doing a mini movie, you know. Certainly. It's, you know, and it, it's, it's it's very hard. It's not just it's it, there's also, of course, an easy way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> where you can just do whatever you want, who cares, right? But if you want to do it right, then I think you should learn from, from people who are very good and successful with it because you'll, you'll see the difference and, you know, you learn a lot from them. Absolutely. Well, you know, yeah, we, you know, so people can, again, find the movie at uh, Keno Lover's website at uh, Macab Films. Doc, yes, is it macabfilms.com? Right, that's my website and you can buy it from me, which would be nice. And, Absolutely. Um, and Amazon as well. So, um, and and if you guys like the film, feel free to leave a a comment on Amazon because the more feedback I get, the better it will be for the film. Oh, absolutely, and yeah, no, that's the thing. I want I want people to know how best to support you and your efforts. And yeah, I really do. I would love to see you complete uh, interviewing all the studio guys. I'm concerned about Barry or not Barry Bernie Wrightson. Um, you know, he had a kind of a rough uh, health uh, year. In the last year or so, I don't know if you've if you've heard recently how he's doing. I haven't, and I, no. and I don't know if. Yeah, I ha- I've heard about that, but I haven't heard back from him. And I I, I try not to, um, you know, I tried not to to interfere or or, or question too much, only because I I you know I I want to give him some privacy because I know. Oh, certainly. I know health issues are not fun issues, and. Sure. You know, I'll just wait and see what happens with that in time, but. But I think uh, for now, I got Barry. Um, I almost want to say I'm sure I could get Michael, but I don't want to be presumptuous. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Understood. Barry. Yeah. So, so well, he came that. across incredibly, incredibly comfortable on your film. And my own experience with him, uh, big, gregarious, fun guy, and yes. really was incredibly kind. And I mean, God, I, I met him 10 years ago at a show, and we were talking, and uh, he was doing sketches for people. And it was, I'm like, well, you know, could I get a sketch? He said, sure. And I said, how much? And he said, how much do you want to pay? And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm like, well, I don't want to, like, insult $5? you. Five dollars? Well, no, yeah. Well, that's, and I, I'm like, is $60 insulting? And he's like, not at all. And he and he drew this, be- it was on the back of one of those uh, comic book, uh, the, the cardboard they put in when they bag the uh, comics. And he did this lovely little ske- shadow sketch that really filled the entire thing. And I mean, I am really excited that I have this lovely Michael Kaluta piece. But it was at a time where I didn't have a lot of money. I was between jobs, and I'm like, "Well, it, it, would that insult you?" And he's like, "Not at all." And he's a very, and, very nice guy, very smart man as well. Because I know when I interviewed him, there was a lot of things he said that was very, very educational and informative, and especially okay. during the past. You know, I mean, he's like a walking encyclopedia of like what happened in the '70s and with the artists back then. And I thought. It, I caught it all on tape, but I have a very, very good editor by the name of Mark Jackson, who lives in L.A., who edited for me, and he was very strict. He wouldn't let me go over 90 minutes. <laughs> Interesting. Wow, yeah, it's an 82-minute film, so... <laughs> well, he, <laughs> That's I, really he's, he's an awesome guy. I mean, I and thank God he's going to be working with me again. Um, I hope, unless you know something comes up, but uh, but yeah, he's an amazing editor, and without him, you know, the story would have been like all over the place, and I would have had like a, you would have had a five-hour movie. <laughs> That's all right. I would have watched a five-hour movie. Honestly, I, I thought I, it was fascinating. Right. Well, but I, I told I told him I said, well, okay, why don't the people let's do the five hours, and the people who can't stand five hours can just leave, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't, is, um, he didn't go for it. He didn't go. For I understand. I understand. <laughs> it, but that was also, so <laughs> another person that you have on your on your crew uh, works with Game of Thrones, and I'm and I'm forgetting now. Yes, he's my assistant director. Will Simpson is the storyboard artist for Game of Thrones for all seasons. He's been like wow. from the beginning to now. He's he's also uh, Northern Ireland's pr- premier uh, storyboard artist for films. He's worked with. All directors like Neil Jordan, um, wow. all these guys that are, you know, and, and I was very lucky because he, he's a good friend of mine, a big fan of the studio guys, and he taught me. And he was actually the monkey 
on my back <laughs> because when I when we were doing the film, I you know remember it was the first time I was interviewing people, so sometimes I would talk over people, which is not a good thing, right? So I had a tendency to do that, and what he would do is whenever they set me up, wherever I'm supposed to sit, he they would put an extra chair for my assistant director, Will Simpson, and he would be behind me and he would tap my shoulders if I'm over, you know, if I do something wrong or say something wrong. You should. Yes. So he was like my signal man, and he <laughs> um, he taught me really well. In the end, he, <laughs> we were supposed to tap on the left shoulder all the time, and then one time at the end of, you know, when we were wrapping up, he tapped me on the, what was it, the, the, the right shoulder, the other yes. shoulder, and, and that confused me, so I had to stop sh- uh, shooting, and I said, what was that for? I said, oh, you're doing well now, he said. <laughs> <laughs> One for yes, two for no. That's very good. I like yes, that. Yes, we had that. He was on all my interviews that way. He was right behind me. He was right behind me because he, he wanted to, you know, he was teaching me. It was amazing. I, Like I said, I couldn't have done this film the way it was without my amazing crew. So. Well, I appreciate you, you pointing out, you know, some of your, you know, uh, the things that, that they had to correct you on because it doesn't come across in the film. The, the film really does. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a first film. It it really does. It tells this very interesting story well. And uh, I, really, the interviews, uh, the, the responses uh, that you were able to get and the way that you put it together, it's absolutely worth seeing. It's called Better Things, The Life and Choices of Jeffrey Catherine Jones. And it's on DVD. And again, we'll uh, at the end of this conversation, I'll tell you again how you can get it. And uh, I'm going to try and get uh, you know some of the Chicago people to figure out a screening or something like that, so that uh, you, you you visit Chicago occasionally. And, I, and I'm hoping that we can make this happen and uh, mm-hmm. set some, something up down the road because more people need to see this. And I and I really I, I hope that people who listen to the interview will will buy the DVD or buy the download. And uh, and spread the word because this film really does need to be seen, and this part of comics history uh, should not go forgotten. So thank you for doing the film, yeah, and really looking you. forward to yeah, absolutely and looking forward to uh, whatever you've got coming up. And uh, please stay in touch, and we'll uh, when you when the next film is ready, you are more than welcome to come back and talk again. Oh well, thank you so much, and I really appreciate this, um, John. Thanks again. <laughs> really glad I had the opportunity to uh, talk to Maria. And let you all know about uh, the excellent film, Better Things, The Life and Choices of Jeffrey Catherine Jones. Uh, Please uh, check it out uh, through Amazon or uh, through uh, Maria's site as well, Macab Films. And uh, I I really hope that you do take a chance to uh, uh, buy this film and view it. It's, It's exceptional. It really, really is.